Yo, what is up? You have found We Like the Blazer! I am Brandon Goldner, and over there wearing an Oregon Ducks hoodie, definitely not feeling ill whatsoever. It is your friend, my friend, Ryan Whitledge. Ryan, what's up, man? Oh, not much. Just, How's that you know, for energy? I, uh, is that good? That's that's fantastic. It's more energy than I've had all, all, all weekend. Yes, as In your I'm entire coming life. Off. I- <laughs> not oh not my entire life you know cocaine's a wonderful th- no joke no. <laughs> i have a funny cocaine no, no. story oh god <laughs> uh, that's What's gonna that? be any that, that uh, you have, yeah, go let's go here's my funny cocaine story when i first moved out of my parents house i was moving in with a guy a roommate i didn't actually know him super well but i knew that he had a cocaine habit and i said hey man I'm super 420 friendly, but I don't want to see any cocaine at our share our now shared place, please. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. I come home the very first night after moving in. I open the door. He has a bottle of Windex, a roll of paper towels, and he's cleaning the glass coffee table. And I go, Joe, what the fuck are you doing? And he goes, Hey man, you want a bump? And I'm like, No, I don't want a fucking bump. I, what did I fucking say? Anyway. That's my funny cocaine story. It's I know I'm not gonna lie, but super yeah. respectful. You said you didn't want to see it. He's like, well, shit, I gotta clean this. You know, <laughs> you know the coffee I think table he was is always gonna be in preparation. Spotless. He was doing it in preparation of, and I caught on to that immediately. Anyway, whatever. And a whole another story about bloody, you know, toilet paper in the bathroom trash. But Ryan, that's not why we're here. Uh, <laughs> so many follow up questions about like if you know. The drugs you're putting in your body and your concern is that there might be dust on the glass table that you're snorting it from. <laughs> hey, you know, Never I respect mind what's prob- what the cocaine is probably mixed with, but you know, that the fucking human, dead human skin cells there, we gotta get that shit off there right now. Doesn't matter if it's been uh, buffed with spackle, he needs to make sure that the glass is clean. You know, respect for uh, wanting to have a clean work surface, I suppose, but um, yeah, that's my, that's my story. Uh, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, I want to, I, I don't know if uh, you're willing to put this out in the space, but uh, uh, you can keep it as a quiet congratulations, but congratulations to you and the missus uh, for Thank some you. big life changes yes. here. Uh, we actually have not gone social media official, but, you know, podcast official, let's let's make it so. We did buy a house, which is so cool. Uh, very exciting. It's a little overwhelming, and we're still in the process of getting there. So, uh, you know, it, and it's just a lot of logistics, and there's a lot of like the crushing weight of like, this is our responsibility. And like, we have the mm-hmm. radon test going, and we have to follow up with the inspections and what comes from that. And we have to install blinds, and we have to do pea gravel and bark mulch. And we have to, there's some leveling we need to do of the sidewalk because the tree, re- and it's all of our fucking responsibility now. So, like, yeah, man. I mean, you know, like it's just, I mean, oh, I yeah. first time homeowner homeowner for me, like honestly, not something I ever thought was was gonna be possible for, for me for most of my life. And only lately did it become a possibility. It's very cool. So like, yeah, um, can't wait to have you over. Uh, but um yeah, this is but- this is the second home that that I've owned. And I will say when I went from home ownership back to renting, there was a very glorious phase where when things started to break, I was so fucking excited because <laughs> all I had to do was call a number. And I'm not going to lie. I, I was never more pissed off and depressed than when after we bought this place, uh, the light bulb went out above my my stove in my micro or my micro range. And I was like. <laughs> fuck, I have to source this light bulb. And apparently (laughs) that light bulb in and of itself is like a $45 light bulb. And so, you know, that light bulb is still being sourced because I've learned there are other lights in the kitchen you can turn on. I don't, I don't need that light bulb, not for $45. I, wow. I have a lamp that requires, it's like, it is, it's a funky halogen, you know, and and it it lasts for a long time, but I've had to, I've had in the 10 years I've owned this lamp, I've had to think get a bulb twice. And each time it's a pain in the ass. So I feel your pain. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a ceiling fan in my living room and it has two light sources. One is a light that just regular light bulb that shines right down, but it also has this cool feature of like this ring, this ring light to where it kind of casts a very much dimmer light up. Well, apparently that is created by 10 light bulbs and 
that's a right a, right after we closed it they're all leds i'm sure they're i'm sure oh, yeah, they're great fine. for the environment but but right after we moved in is when i realized that th- all of those were burnt out and i was like oh well that's so i get up there and then that's when i figure out it's like 10 bulbs and not just like three you know little led strips or something like that and so i was like okay and i take them all out and then i go to home depot and each one of those bulbs is 15 dollars god it's so so, that's that is also another light in my house where i'm like you know what i don't need that function we're good (laughs) yeah it's i mean i'm if you ask cassie she'll tell you i'm a big light snob i care very much about the quality of light and if it's direct or indirect and what color temperature is it and is it dimmable and so i'm hoping that like you know one kind of a do it myself project is that some of the lights we have that are not currently dimmable to make sure that those are capable of being dimmable and putting in the correct switches and getting the right bulb so but that's not why we're here brian we're here to talk about the blazers and i think you know pat ourselves on the back Maybe not the same calendar month, but we are recording twice within a 30-day span. <sighs> Room for improvement. Oh. Uh, hey, hey, it only it only goes up from here. Um, and uh the Blazers had a trade deadline. They it happened. Uh I asked if you could please, because I didn't, didn't do it. My now my keyboard's <laughs> over here. What was the transaction that the Blazers completed? Because they were not among the teams that did nothing. They did something, but the something they yeah. did was very minor uh please give us the details of this transaction uh the something they did was something that i don't think anybody really wanted but they uh they acquired a backup forward uh delano banton from the boston celtics for a second round pick that is so protected they might it might as well have not gone through traded i think it's tell us about those protections ryan because that's the funniest part about this (laughs) I think it's like top 55 protected. So like and how many picks w- are there total? 60. 60? Yeah. So, <laughs> I, it, it's, I'm trying to understand, like, uh, I guess the Celtics wanted to free up the roster spot for some reason, which makes sense. They're a contending team. They want to try to, you know, pack their roster with as many playable players as they can, because in essence, the Blazers got this player for literally nothing. That pick is not going to be conveying. Yeah. It's just some of some of the transactions that you see on NBA trade deadlines are just so hilarious because all it is, is just calling your buddies to move money around. You're like, ah, I need to shuffle like half a million dollars or $750,000. If I, if I cut him, I'm on the hook for this. Do you just want him? All right. Uh, we got to make this work. So second round pick. Sure. But we don't really need him. All right. Great. Top 55 protected. Solid. So done. File the paperwork. <laughs> You yeah. know, and this was also a trade that it was like, I think it was like the last reported trade that happened on the deadline. Like we're sitting here at like 2.59 p.m. And it's like, oh, here's a note from Woj. So, which well, I, I I do love Woj's trolling with a lot of the trade deadline things because obviously he knows the online chatter. He know, You know, everybody's talking about Malcolm Brogdon, you know, Jeremy Grant, you know, these bigger moves that the Blazers could make. And I feel as though he purposely piecemeals out or writes his tweets to troll people of like the Portland Trail Blazers are trading at, or are trading with the Boston Celtics and the actual trade itself is at the very bottom. So that you have to read the first, you know, 150 50 words to get to the 10 words that matter and all 150 words are just getting everybody's expectations higher and higher and higher. And then nut kick at the end. I mean, let's be honest. Had you heard of Delano Banton before this trade? I'm not going to lie until I just read that he was a backup forward. I thought he was a guard. Well, so I, I is, just learned his. I think he is. I just I think learned he's a his position guard. two minutes ago. Well, great. Everybody's a combo guard. I mean, well, LeBron James is so, a combo everything. He's like a he's like a dollar store Sean Livingston. He's a six nine point guard who can't shoot threes. I think that's his deal. And look, like I'll don't we honest, already have a shorter I, version of that? <laughs> yes, you can never have too many. I I literally had not heard of Mr. Banton until this trade, and that's no shade on him. You know, shame on me. Um, and like, look again, the Blazers got him for free. I think it, it's, it, you know, the, in the three games he's played for Portland, he's averaged 23 minutes a game. He's averaging 10, three and two dimes in a steal. I mean, like for a team that clearly has no interest in winning and every interest in development, 
having an extra body, someone who's, I mean, he's not super young, he's 24 years old, but 24 years old, having someone else in your system. Hey, if Mike Schmitz sees something in this six, nine dollar store, Sean Livingston, then I, I'm all for it. Like they didn't give up anything for it. But let me ask you yeah. this though. And then we're, Oh, go for it. No, you go. go. Uh, I was just going to ask, I mean, and it, you know, we're, <laughs> The trade deadline came and went with that being the single transaction. The Portland Trailblazers still have Jeremy Grant on the roster, Malcolm Brogdon on the roster, Robert, Robert Williams, who's injured on the roster. Maybe you could even say they still have Anthony Simons on the roster, question mark. Like if you're one of those people who are wanting to get really aggressive about moving him, were you disappointed that the Blazers didn't do more at this trade deadline. I've seen a lot of stuff on Twitter saying sleepy Joe Cronin. He's asleep at the wheel again. Didn't do anything. Like why didn't he trade Malcolm Brogdon? Like how do you, are you disappointed that the Blazers didn't do more? I'm not disappointed because I didn't expect them to do more, but you can also put me firmly in the camp of people that believe that, you know, Brogdon is maybe a guy that it's better suited to trade him in the off season or, you know, draft night or whatever, um, because this is quote unquote, a, a weak draft and just, you know, having more picks for the sake of having picks isn't, you know, necessarily the best way to build a team. You know, you can, you can argue each way, but I, I just find myself in the camp of that. You know, if he has first round pick value, it was reported that, you know, there was extremely heavy interest in him. I don't imagine that that extremely heavy interest is going to suddenly disappear throughout the rest of the season. So if you're not enamored with acquiring, you know, any of the picks or any of the, you know, little ancillary salary filler players that were on the table, then yeah, just hold on to them. I mean, I've never been a fan of the coming off as the make a move for the sake of making a move. We went through that a lot with Olshay in which he would make some sort of move to make a move and then sell us on why that move was the greatest move of all time. So, you know, unless you wanted to go with a, uh, a Brogdon for a, uh, a Jeremy Shohan and uh Victor Wembenyama uh, plus salary filler. Yeah. I yeah, just hold on to him, but you know, right. it, it like, is what it is, you know, and Jer- as in, in regards to Jeremy Grant, However much fans want to scream online that he should have been traded, you know, it just, it's not going to happen. And I also don't think that the Blazers organization are really for some of these guys that are probably going to be moved eventually are in the habit of just moving them for the sake of moving them. It might be conversations that they had like, Hey, Brogdon, here's some offers that we might consider like, Hey, you open to this kind of thing. Nah, you know, especially now that he's going through some injury stuff and he's rehabbing. Nah, I'd much rather just finish out the season here, you know, whatever. Yeah. And just keep it that way. So yeah, there's stuff behind the scenes that we don't know, but it's uh, all just boils down to that. You know, I'm, I'm I'm fine with it. I wasn't expecting them to to do all that much, and they didn't. So I feel like your mo for the season is keep your expectations low, buddy. I feel like you've said that uh, about many different topics that we've talked about. Like, and by the way, like Ryan, like we got to get you back into like how to how to make a hot take. I was so disappointed. I couldn't believe <laughs> it. I was freaking out. Well, so like okay, what I put in the people obviously can't see. We're not releasing this on video. I put in the chat a link to every transaction at the 2024 trade deadline. I wanted to look at it to refresh my memory and it matches with what I remember. The reason why I'm actually not super disappointed, I would have preferred Malcolm Brogdon in particular to have been moved at this deadline. I think that there is an advantage to being not good this year, get the best pick you can move your veteran players for more bites at the apple. The reason why I'm not that disappointed is when you tick down this list, so many of these transactions involved to your point earlier, they involved second round picks, not first. The one exception is Danny Ainge continuing to be a Svengali over the entire league and getting a first round pick for Kelly Olenek. Why did the Raptors do that? I have no idea whatsoever, but so many of these transactions were second round picks, right? Like you look at, uh, you know, um, 
uh, Boyan Bogdanovich, like the Knicks are getting him for, you know, Fournier and my doppelganger ganger, Ryan Archidiakono and some second round picks, right? Like the thunder mm-hmm. taking a flyer on an injured Gordon Hayward, second round picks and some filler. Uh, you're looking at the 76ers getting buddy healed for, you know, a couple of people and some second round picks, the Mavericks adding PJ Washington, for, you know, so like, I actually, they did trade a first in that to be fair. Okay. But the point being that there wasn't like this huge league wide marketplace of players of Malcolm Brogdon's impact where you could plug him into virtually any team. If you need like a fourth or fifth starter or like a super good sixth man, Malcolm Brogdon's a really, really solid player who could raise the floor and maybe even raise the ceiling of a good team. I don't blame Joe Cronin for looking at the marketplace and saying, you know what we think to your point earlier, we could get more for him in the off season. So while I wish they would have moved Brogdon in particular, I'm actually not that disappointed when you look at all the transactions that happened around the league. Yeah. And one of the things that jumps out to me the most is that, um, you know, even if you want to kind of see how the market was look no farther than the Raptors. You know, after all throughout all this year, you know, when OG Ananobi, you know, when that trade went through and he went to the Knicks, yes. Um, You know, you're looking at that and going, really, that's all it took to get him or that's what the Raptors settled on for him. And then, you know, now you're looking at when Siakam's traded to the Pacers in a three team deal, like the only let's see Raptors received two 2024 first round picks from the Pacers and a conditional first round pick in 2026. You know, the asking prices are so low because I don't think teams are clamoring for first round picks this year. So it's, it, it, it just wasn't there for. I I also wonder how, like, (laughs) you have to think of the, the, the NBA is a closed ecosystem, right? There's 30 teams, there's 30 GMs, There's only so many players, only so many draft picks you can move. I'm actually wondering how teams like Oklahoma City and the Utah Jazz having so many future picks is impacting the market. I mean, we even saw, for example, OKC, uh, I forget which team they traded for, but they basically traded one of their own first round picks for a future pick swap because they have so many picks that they can't pick the players they would be picking with their picks. They have too many picks. I wonder how that's impacting things. Right. Cause again, it's a closed ecosystem. Um, yeah. I, I, so all to say, I I don't think the blazers are missing out on this like potential generational player by not getting one additional pick the pick, the the best pick they're going to have this year is their own pick. So actually from that perspective, you could say, well, you should be as bad as possible in order to get that pick as good as possible. But the Blazers are probably mm-hmm. going to be firmly between, you know, four and seven. The lottery odds have been slightly flattened. Maybe they'll jump up and get one of the top picks. You know, you know, it happened last year, so it could happen again. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not too upset about it. What I am stoked about, though, probably the more important, frankly, transaction is the Blazers extending a full three-year NBA contract to center Duop Reef. Let's go. Uh, what a cool story this dude is 27 year old who has been playing internationally for many years, came up to the G league this summer uh, or signed with Portland summer league team in 2023, signed a two way deal in October. He's been very solid uh, and just one of those players that are it's like very easy to like uh, going to be probably like a forever cult favorite in Portland. But do you have any strong opinions about the Blazers pulling the trigger and maybe like, maybe like gauging that he was going to get some interest this summer. And so you may as well lock him up now. Um, Any feelings about getting due up on a real NBA contract? I mean, it's exactly that. Like, you know, he's, he's been playing decently. He's been playing good. He's, he's very much a player that you can just, you know, throw in when and where you need him. And, you'll get a couple boneheaded mistakes, but his positives are a lot more than his negatives. And so, you know, especially with, the, the what they signed him to, you know, it's it makes sense. G- give him a shot. You know, he's, as you said, worked his way through the G League. So, like, even though he's an older player per se, you know, he's still going to be developing along with these guys. So it's it, he, he's a good and he's proven to be a good, you know, break in case of emergency center 
for the team. So I think he's started, he's played 40 games this season has started 11. So, I mean, it's, it's a big man position of depth kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, no, no harm, no foul in, in getting him signed and, and getting him locked in. So, and especially too, you know, as we're talking about things with, you know, trades in the off season, that's another serviceable player that could possibly be thrown in to any sort of move to make a salary work. That's not just a, a yep. no name. Who's this guy? He's made a name for himself. So it's, it's. It's a good player to have, like I said, a, a breaking case of emergency center. They've broken for emergency 11 times, but it's also, a, he's a good player to have that, you know, you can theoretically throw into sweet in a pot or make money work down the road. So it's a, it's an asset retention and an, and an asset building thing. So he also, I mean, he, it, maybe the age doesn't quite align because again, he's older than you might think, but like his skill set at that position is very useful for a Scoot Henderson, like do up being able to, to, uh, to extend out to three is not only a capable three point shooter, but is like super willing to take it. I mean, that was the first thing I remember when I was watching him play early in the season was like, this dude's not playing like he's on a two way, like this dude's playing like a veteran and like, he understands what he's good at, what he can do and how he can help. Uh, and sometimes mm -hmm. that's like, it's like 90% of it, right. Is like that the other team has to respect your ability to shoot. So opening the floor for someone like Scoot Henderson, uh, I don't have the advanced stats in front of me. And if I did, I would love to see kind of how much better or worse the Blazers are when do is on the floor. I think in my brain, I feel like, there's some like statistical significance demonstrating that the Blazers are like noticeably better when Duop Reef is playing, but uh, don't quote me on that because I don't have it pulled up and now my keyboard is over there, so I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, okay, so it sounds familiar. I, I swear I heard I've seen something about that. I think he has one of the highest plus minuses of anyone on the team. So I th that tracks that that I have that same memory. Now we could be living in an echo yeah. chamber, and what you said, I just am providing a confirmation bias for you. But but uh, we'll just roll with it. What are friends for? But to confirm our biases, I love you and I appreciate that. So okay, so we have that. Uh, all right. Moving on, you want to talk about Scoot Henderson or you want to talk about something else? Well, so two things on Scoot. Uh, you know, for one, uh, Billups just a little bit ago, I think uh, right after they went on break, right before they went on break, they had said, uh, it said as it stands right now, Scoot, you know, will be in the starting lineup for the rest of the season. Uh, I think he deserves it. I think coming off the bench for that while was good for him. Um, you know, let him I get agree. comfortable, let let him play his way into a starting lineup. You know, again, it's, we always want to revert back to, you know, all of our short-term memories of back to 2012 where Dame was suddenly the starting point guard and he was great, but he was also 24 and a lot more seasoned. It was a lot to ask. I've always believed even back to before we traded Dame, you know, it was a lot to ask Scoot to come in and be this, sensational starting point guard at 19 years old. You know, he just turned 20, whatever, but it let him work his way in. Let's finish out the season. He's got his sea legs under him for, you know, how the NBA works. Let's see if he can now keep ticking up his production and his level of play in the starting lineup. So it's the equivalent of Dame's sophomore season at Weber state. So to your point, yeah. Like, and yeah, I, and Hey, noted Chauncey Billups hater, Brandon Goldner is saying, I think Chauncey Billups did the right thing by having him come off the bench for a while. I, I think that like understanding a player, like where they are in their development, like when it's good to push, when it's good to pull, right. When it's good to kind of throw them to the wolves and let them learn. And when it's good for them to gain confidence, I think mm -hmm. Chauncey Billups has actually approached the Scoot Henderson thing the right way as evidenced by in the last six games, Scoot Henderson averaging now 18 points, five dimes, three rebounds on 43% shooting, still pretty low, but shooting 40% from deep on four attempts. That's not crazy volume, uh, but that's not nothing. So yeah. And like, yeah. I, I, I like that, that he now had, it, it, it's almost like now he's kind of earned the starting spot through his play, right? Not just because he was their third draft pick, but he's now yeah. demonstrated at least in a small sample size that he has earned it. And I don't know if that like gives him more confidence or gives the team more confidence. You know what I mean? Just like, I'm not saying that has to be that way with every rookie, but like, I, maybe that's a good thing too. I'm just, Hey, look, I'm well, putting on my rose colored glasses here. Ryan is <laughs> all I'm doing. Your rose city colored glasses as, as one may say. But <laughs> 
But I, the other thing too, is that, especially with the, the Shaden Sharp, you know, post-surgery, you know, injury news, you know, it's, if Sharp comes back at all this season, I'll be kind of shocked, but this By is the way, now. Shaden Sharp had injuries and he had surgery on his core. Count it. Okay. Sorry. There we go. Now we have broken that news. Breaking news, everyone. I'll <laughs> <laughs> be fine. Successful surgery, yeah. But, so fine. with with him being out, and you know, if if he even comes back at all this season, now is also a very important time for uh, the organization to now that Scoot has played his way into being a passable starting point guard in the NBA to see if him and Amphrey Simons can actually coexist together without any sort of weirdness of from Scoot of am I coming off the bench? Am I starting? What are my minute splits going to be with Shaden? This is now a great time to sit there and look okay here's here's your starting point guard and scoot here's your starting point guard and and <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say so much, what position is simon playing again and and I don't know. Uh, can, and can, can i disagree they, with can you they coexist? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it's apples to apples. I, look, I mean, so I, much, so much of the NBA too is we are, you have two guards, two forwards and a center. That's the league, you know, split hairs so, on who has PG and who has SG. I think the league just needs to go G G F F C. There you go. Make it like the all-star selection. G T F O. Look, I, the, the thing <laughs> that I want to say is to your point, the league is oriented a certain way with certain positions. I do think there's a, there's a separate sidebar kind of like five drinks in thought experiment of like, if every team just played five centers, dot, 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 then that would be like, the, it's, it's pretty arbitrary how we have positions. And I, I actually don't believe that the, the, the positions that teams play is because that's like the optimal way to field a team. I think it's because that's how every team does it. And there's a little bit of like, you know, you see teams who kind of break the mold and they like, like the Suns in the, in the mid two thousands of the warriors in the, in the mid 2010s, where then the league kind of changes Flippers a little bit. as of late, who just has totally. everybody who's a forward. So like, <laughs> um, but having said that, given the paradigm is what it is like it, if you're saying that you want to see how Scoot Henderson and Anthony Simons play together, what you're also saying is that you are willing to give up Shaden Sharp. I don't think that that's like an unreasonable take, but in my mind, where I'm thinking is maximize the ability for Scoot and Sharp to work together. I, I, I'm, I'm a firmer believer than most that Anthony Simons needs to go uh, for the betterment of, of that specific point is that you have these two players, both with potential all NBA or all-star ceilings. You're not going to see the best out of either one of them, unless they get a chance to play together heavy minutes. If you have Anthony Simons there, you can't do that. So like, and again, like I get, like so so i guess i don't i don't see a world in which the blazers have reached their maximum potential with scoot henderson and anthony simons is still on the team that's i i don't i i don't know i i can I completely agree between the time that Scoot has missed this year and the t- or and parts of the season you know last year i think there's ample sample size ample sample there we go uh ample sample size ample sample of of seeing how um, Shaden and Ant play together. And so this is just now getting that other data set. And especially with Mike Schmitz and Joe Cronin, we know they're going to love, you know, what crunching some numbers, you know, I don't necessarily think that means it's at the expense of Shaden. I think he's pretty firmly entrenched and locked into the future of this organization. But I do think as much as it may lean towards that, Anthony Simons has to go. I do think there does need to be um, some data and some observations in on which route should we go? Should we go an Ants Shaden route or should we go in an uh, a Scoop Shaden route? I don't now, see if now if they're ballsy enough to decide that they want to go an Ant Shaden route. <laughs> My God, I I will just get a bucket of popcorn be and watch the. I great. it and will I, not I, be good when you've given but, up Damian Lillard to go for Scoot and then you bail on Scoot. <laughs> so okay, so let's just let's just be let, let let us be clear. Scoot Henderson has not yet shown that he is a franchise player. 
I think what Correct. you can say is that after the beginning of the season where you got really freaked out saying, is this guy even like a sub all-star level player in the future? I think now you can, the ceiling is a lot easier to see over the last couple of weeks and month. And that's, it, it, that's extremely encouraging. However, the Blazers, they, the Blazers will not know whether Scoot Henderson is a franchise level player for years, plural. So that's the yeah. problem with keeping Anthony Simons on this team is that I don't think you can even see that if Anthony Simons is on this team. So like, I yeah. like, so I, and, and I, again, like the, the, the job of Joe Cronin and Mike Schmitz, both to evaluate young talent and also to evaluate the trade market. It is difficult. It does depend on timing. It does depend on this closed ecosystem of 29 other teams and what their needs are and what the market is. But I, I think if I were the Blazers, I would be leaning more heavily towards if you have to give up Anthony Simons for slightly less than you think he's worth, you have to do it in order to see whether or not Scoot Henderson is that guy. You're not going to know for years, and I don't think you're going to know if Anthony Simons is on this team. Yeah, and it's I I I, I don't think Ant is long for the team, but the team is not necessarily – ready to exist without and so that's just that's that's my take on it i just that's fair i mean and and like and look like given where scoot henderson is and frankly shaden sharp you do need some players to bring some coherence and some cohesion and some coordination lots of c words to the team anthony Simons is one of those people i think it's fine i i'm just if he's still on this team after this upcoming off season i'm starting to feel kind of wiggly because again, I, I think that you need him off the team in order to see what Scoot Henderson is. But anyway, can I, um, can I famously do what I'm known for and kick the can down the road just a smidge and say, uh, I, I, it's not love it, this coming off season. It's, it's not this coming off season for me. But I, if if he were to be on the team past next year's trade deadline, then I, it's kind of worrying for me. So, but fair enough. I mean, I, I, my my I just needed the can is on a you... spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> My feeling of concern is, is not, you know, it's, it's a gradient. So I'll feel a little worse if he's still on the team after the off season, a little worse than that. If you so yeah, but let's quickly talk about Scoot Henderson and his performance at the all-star game. Uh, it's cool. He was on the rookie team somehow for the third time, because he was on there twice as a member of the G league night. Uh, he had a, uh, in, in that game, the one game that he played in the formats a little bit different in, than in years past. I don't really want to yeah, get into that. He had that a cool format. He had a cool crossover on Chet Holmgren. Super cool. Woo. Uh, he also came off the bench to lead team Tamika with 10 points. It was the first he game. Started. of NBA. What's that? He started not according to the Oregonian says he came oh, off. The Oregonian the bench. got it wrong. Good. The, and I know uh, the only I reason that I, the only reason that I know this is because I had, there's only, I only pay attention to certain parts of the entire all-star weekend uh, because the NBA continue, the <laughs> continues to piss me off by constantly changing the format of everything. And I don't yeah. know why they can't just bring back the classic versions of it. Anyways, that rant, I will continue that rant later on. But so for this game, I had no clue and maybe they've done it in years past. And I just didn't know that they did this tournament style setting. And so like I had it on and I saw the first four, five minutes I was actively watching the game. So I saw scoot in there. I saw him start. If somehow he didn't actually start then okay he missed the first five seconds whatever but i saw him start you know um he looked a little confused like he didn't know what he was supposed to do trying to get his sea legs uh a lot of playing attempting to play some really aggressive defense right away before i feel as though somebody told him hey bro we don't do that here (laughs) yeah and then and then he got a little settled in and then i went to go start making dinner with the game on in the background and then next thing i look up it's two completely different groups of people that are out there playing games and i am like what i'm like what the fuck is going on and then i was like oh wait this is a tournament format but okay whatever and then i stopped watching because I'm so like, there were the fuck? four right. teams. There were four teams for young players, essentially. Why? I don't know. You had Team Tamika, you know, led by Tamika Catchings. Team Jalen, led by Jalen Rose. 
Team Detlef, led by Detlef Shrimp, <laughs> Blazers legend, and Team Pow, led by Pau Gasol, also Blazers legend. Uh, so, yeah, Scoot Henderson, whether he started or not, he did lead his team. He had approximately a third of his team's points because Team Tamika only scored 35 points. Scoot Henderson had 10 of those, went four for six, uh, including one for two from deep, and also had an assist. You love to see it. The point being, Scoot, in the time that he played, played well. Best player on the team, team lost, super cool. Good job, Scoot. Um, also, we cannot leave, and not to say we're leaving right this second, but as you know, I'm kind of in a time crunch. Uh, Damian Lillard repeats. He defends. First time in 17 years? First 16, time in 17, 17 years, years. You have a repeat champion of the NBA's three point contest. Now, this was a little strange this year because you had two very good three point shooters who were not participating because they were facing off against themselves and Sabrina Ionescu and Seth and Steph Curry. Oh, it said Seth Curry. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Seth Curry's brother, Steph, uh, weren't <laughs> participating in the three point contest because they were playing each other. Turns out Steph Curry wins. Cause he's really good. Sabrina Ionescu also very good. Had as many points did Sabrina as Dame did winning the event. But the point is to say, congratulations to Dame. You love to see it. It was funny because like there's this, you know, semi-viral clip of, I think it was Chris Haynes asking him before the event, Hey Dame, can you recreate the shot where you did the wave goodbye against Paul George, the Oklahoma city thunder. And Dame was like, why are y'all living in the past? Like, can we get over this? And, uh, and and he got egged on to like, just shoot the shot again. And he missed. And then Dame said, I guess I don't got it anymore. And everyone took that and ran it. Then Dame is washed and this, that, and the other, then he wins the event. Let's go Dame. You love to see it. I have a question. Was that last rack intentional? Did he intentionally oh, that's do what, that? That's what happened last year. He wins it on the last ball. I probably not, but you never know. Like that's got to um, be a branding thing, especially see because now his thing too is, and I am so shocked and surprised is that he actually has a, a collaboration and endorsement with uh, a watch company. Which yeah, how has Dame Time existed for so long without him previously having a deal with a watch company? But he does now. Disappointing so. watch, by the way. Really bland. Yeah, not a fan. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a watch guy, so I I can't count. I couldn't tell you if that's a fancy watch or a bland watch because I, I I hate watches. So I it's got just nothing sort of there, a, but... it's like a muted 1980s adjacent gold, and there's nothing about it other than what I just said. It's not it's, anyway. But congratulations oh, to Dame. So it resembles the the uh, Trump sneakers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get into that. Um, Three ninety nine cop a pair. I'm sure they'll be great. <laughs> last thing. So, and I appreciate you all who are listening. We love you. And we will be back uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Cause we do enjoy doing this, but before we leave the blazers are going to come out of the all-star break. Uh, you know, they're what, whatever they're fifth worst in the NBA, something like that. Didn't really make any moves at the deadline. They're mostly healthy. Shaden Sharp's going to be out for a bit. Where do you see, let me put it this way. Do you think the Blazers will have a better record in the second half of the season than they have so far or a worse record just by percentage uh, winning percentage? Worse. Do you think it's worse? Okay. And where did, where, because, so they didn't make any, they didn't if, trade away any veterans. Where's the worst coming from? The worst comes from is that there being a respect for those veterans and a respect for those, those older players in that at a certain point in time, those guys won't be asked to be on the court. That is where you will start seeing some nondescript Adam injuries Silver is going to come in and start finding them though. You know, that is fine. If down. anybody, if anybody including Portland fans gives a shit about anybody getting some rest minutes from the Portland trailblazers. They are sickos that watch way too much basketball, should but ask, you know, that's, you ask Zara that's what, what he it, thinks. I have my cat here, <laughs> but, but that's what I think it's going to come down to is you'll start seeing like, Hey, you know, that nagging back injury that is perfectly fine to play through is oh, now going to keep, keep oh, you out foot. for like, a week or two at a time, whatever. But that, you know, and that's just, that's a respect thing for the vets. You know, if it comes down to it, there's not really much to play for. It's, it's just kind of that give, I, give I, the mean, I, I agree with run. you. I just, I guess what I'm saying is that the NBA has shown that they're getting a little bit more serious about you've, you've got to play people. Like I agree. I, I'm, I don't disagree. And like, I also think like if I may <laughs> bet, but let me ask you this though. What names are currently the draws on the Blazers? If you're a, if you're 
going to see a blazer. You're going to see scoot. You're wanting to see Shaden. If he does suit up again at any point in time this season, you're wanting to see Ant. your draw is not Deandre Ayton and Jeremy Grant. And those are the hey, guys Dominic that are going to be much better lately. Correct. But he's not Jeremy the one Grant that people are high, tickets for. 47 points. Come on, man. At Adam Silver cares about if the marquee names from a team are suddenly the ones that are taking a lot of rest. And it just so happens that the marquee names from the Blazers, two thirds of them are the young guys that you want to see get run. So noted Blazers hater Ryan Willage does not believe that Malcolm Brogdon is a marquee name. How dare you, sir? Do you have anything else before we adjourn this uh, silly? Two quick and- things. Two quick things. One comment, real quick. Tell me I'm wrong. Malcolm Brogdon looks like Andre Miller. Oh, he totally does. And he even kind of plays like him, which is very funny, but yeah, no, exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. I was watching it a couple weeks ago. I was watching a game and I was like, Oh my God, he's not jumping. Oh my God. It's Andre is Malcolm Brogdon, <laughs> Andre Miller's down. child. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I totally yeah. got Andre Miller vibes. And, but anyways, 100%. so that's just one little thing. Uh, the funny. last little thing that I just want to say, Kenny Smith, be better. Come on. Don't take like, don't oh take God. that Sabrina Steph thing last night and devolve it into saying, well, she should do this. What do you expect? Blah, blah, blah. I was talking to my wife before this event started. Cause she kind of, she had slightly heard about it. She's, she pays attention to mostly basketball or to baseball and football. So she's basketball adjacent. And so she had known this was going on, but as she's sitting on the couch, cause this is getting ready to start going. And she was like, whose genius idea was this? And I was like, actually, you know, Sabrina and Steph, their friends, she, after the WNBA all-star game and her three point, you know, she kind of laid the gauntlet out there for Steph. And of course the NBA is just going to take that torch and run with it. And she's like, nobody wins here. Because if she loses, it's going to be nothing but like, oh, well, see, she can't do that like a man can, like from his line. She goes, did they pick it? I said, no, she got the option. She goes, she didn't get an option. That's a false choice. If she says, I'm going to shoot from the girl's line, that's her admitting that, quote unquote, that, you know, she can't do it from the man's line. So she's forced to have to say, yeah, I can do it. She's like, it's a false choice there. Nobody wins. You know, if she loses, ha ha ha, she can't compete with the boys. If Steph loses, ha 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 you got your butt beat by a girl or you let her win it was i'm i'm not saying that it shouldn't have happened i'm just saying that i somehow feel as though there could have been significantly better marketing behind it and that's that kenny that kenny is also totally wrong you know in his thing about you know go play with dolls and do that and what do you expect because we can't keep judging female athletes on can they do this on a man's level. That's not fair to anybody involved. And that goes for any sport. Can we just like let women participate in stuff and enjoy that they're fucking good at basketball? Like, and to your point about like, yes, no matter what, this is going to be just a misogyny magnet. Like there was no winning Sabrina Ionescu to your point, no matter what she did, someone was going to find a way to nitpick it. Like the, the thing that I find most infuriating, you have TNT, which is, you know, a, a partner broadcaster of the NBA, and they're showing this historic event. It's, you know, uh, a woman at the top of her game competing against a man at the top of his game, you know, shades of that that tennis match long ago, right? Like back in the, I think in the early 80s. But like the point being like, this hasn't happened before. It's very fucking cool. And look, we know it's going to be a magnet for misogyny and sexism. And so as the broadcast partner, I think you should tell your talent, hey, like, make sure that when you're talking about this, that you're talking about, you have two incredible athletes and they're on the floor and they're competing and literally just be fucking normal about it guys. And Kenny Smith, Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's like wine drunk or what his problem is. Like, it's just, that's the part about it. That's so infuriating. This is not some dude on his couch with his buddies. It's someone with a microphone and a national audience be better. Who's typically been pretty good about social commentary and stuff when it's entered into, you know, his realm of basketball. So, and again, can we just appreciate that Sabrina Ionescu is really good at basketball and can that not just be the focus we can be allowed to do that. And like, so anyway, whatever it's, yeah. I, I think if this is something that, that the league wants to continue doing, because I do agree that it was good and it was, it was cool. By the way, I'm totally pro video basketball court. Fucking get those things installed in every arena stat. 
because oh, then you can man. design you know. can design any court you want on the fly. Someone's Whatever. gonna hack and it come, and put like a dick butt on the court, and then you're gonna be really and in trouble. That will be freaking glorious the moment that there is some sort of fucking porn broadcast live. But oh anyways, besides God. the point, I if the NBA wants to stick with this, like one of the old school events that they used to do, and I think it was part of a skills challenge, was that they would do the they'd have a current player, a legend player, and then a WNBA player from like that city or that team. You know, and they'd all group compete, blah, blah, blah. I think if the NBA wants to keep doing this with the three-point contest, what they should do is take the winner of the WNBA three-point contest and pit them against the last year's winner. So in this case, Damian Lillard. So for next year's All-Star game, have whoever wins this next upcoming WNBA um, All-Star three-point contest, have them go against Damian Lillard. And have it be a champion versus champion. I think that would be a cool idea. And it, and doing it that way may not come off as sensationalized as just saying, we're going to take Sabrina and we're going to take Steph. Maybe there might be a little less heat behind it. There's but some have, structure have the, to it. There's a rhythm to it. Exactly. There's a logic to it. No, I get it. I, yeah. You know, yeah. and 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 with it being that way, I would also probably put that event on one of the weaker nights. I wouldn't put it in this quote unquote strong night. Now, however you think about the crap dunk contest, I'm pro Mac McClung. I hope he wins it every effing year until he retires. <laughs> but uh, um, I would probably put that like after or right before the like rising stars challenge, have that be a thing. So that, then fair. you're also not getting, a, you're not getting a, a possible defending champion for the three point contest. That's having to do an entire three point contest before the actual three point contest kind of thing. But I think that's how the league should lean into it. Uh, the the misogyny also, of it was, was stupid, but by, by the way, like, you know, NBA all-star weekend is becoming all-star weekend, right? You have people who are not in the NBA who are competing in events. You have people period. You have people who are not in the NBA competing in events period of, of different leagues of different stripes. And so like, maybe that's, maybe that's the point to lean into. It's like, you have, the, the, the basketball hall of fame, right? So maybe the all-star event becomes less a celebration of the NBA and more a celebration of basketball. Let's get some youth events in there, right? Like let's get some international stuff going. Like that's kind of, that's not a bad idea actually. And well, they, to your leaned, point, they leaned into the, the international stuff. I want to say even as yeah. late as last year where they did like a USA versus the world kind of thing was their totally. version and of like, like the, the rookie sophomore. So I, I, I like that. I like, like we can, we can continue to expand this event and kind of intermingle people who play in different leagues of all kinds and appreciate some good basketball being played because at the end of the day, isn't that what it's about? It is a sport. This should not be life or death It in, in like, and also yes, like obviously some very serious intersections with issues that are important and affect people. And that is always going to be true of anything where a lot of people are watching it, but it's sports. Let's enjoy it. Let's have fun. And for you to have fun with us, anything else you want to add before I go to the outro? <laughs> Actually, uh, no, we're not going to shit on the dunk contest. Cause we're running out of much like everyone's running out of dunks. Uh, we're running out of thing, things to say about how crappy the dunk contest is. So every dunks already been done. That. The end. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, yeah, you can always so do much that. So that the same guy got jumped over twice. <laughs> We're now jumping over the us. same people twice. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Go. You can always reach out to us at the now active Twitter account at at like the Blazers because the the handle doesn't let you put the we in there. It's at like the Blazers. Amazing. That's interesting, Ryan. It's now active again. And when I go to at Goldner PDX, I get a thing that says this page no longer exists. I wonder if that's a coincidence or not. Uh, you can find Ryan at the witty Ryan. You can also find us at we like the blazers.com or on any podcatcher. If you're listening to this, you probably already found us and we appreciate you. And so until next time, I am Brandon. That is Ryan and go blazers. Go blazers. Go blazers.